After a quick visit to the central Deborah Historic Gold Mine, we spent the day catching up with the family behind Heathcote's Sanguine Estate. Tonight, I feel like a spot of gin, so I'll be visiting local legend Claire Voiton, who founded the highly regarded Heathcote Gin, and we'll be rounding things out with a beer and some food at Palling Brothers Brewery. We're loving our time in Heathcote, so go on, stick around. Heathcote is quickly becoming one of Victoria's must-visit locations for lovers of good food and even better booze. Speaking of, my destination for today is Heathcote Gin. Founded in 2018, this boutique gin distillery has experienced a whirlwind of success. I thought I'd sit down with the woman behind it all. Hello Claire. Hello Georgia, how are you? I'm great, I'm very excited to be here yeah. uh, cool. in your, I suppose it's a cellar door for your gin. Absolutely it is, It's yeah. not just a cellar door though, it's... It's everything it, you want it to be. Yeah, so, it's incredible. Um, yeah, so we're in the main street of Heathcote, 98 High Street, and um, it, it's really been absolutely fantastic. And the locals have really embraced it, which is great. Mm. And so have people from far and wide. I'm quite um, astonished as to how wide the reach is when you have gin. Well, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like your gin has helped a lot with spreading the word. Yeah, absolutely. Talk it's us through the beginnings of your... Uh, Heathcote Gin started over a long lunch in December 2018. Which is not that long ago. I know, <laughs> I know. It's been one of these steep, steep climbs, yeah. which has been really exciting, actually. Uh, so it was actually over a Heathcote Shiraz, uh, turned into a, a real idea early 2019 that became a product um, with some botanicals that I really was fascinated in um, exploring and using into a gin. Um, that it was accepted by one of the biggest re liquor retailers in Australia, um, and that was all before it even launched um, officially, which we did in July 2019. How did that change the trajectory of the business as you saw it prior to It the... was kind of like, here's a business plan and we threw that in the bin <laughs> and then when 2020 came we threw that business plan in the bin as well. But it really what it did is, um, I guess it taught me to identify that the plan is never going to go to plan. <laughs> um, and it really just allowed us to, or enabled me or forced me, I suppose, to actually deal with the the really accelerated growth of, of Heathcote Gin. Mm -hmm. So um, we were, the plan was really just to be a small boutique distillery, but it's sort of gone from little to big very quickly, mm -hmm. of which I'm eternally grateful for, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I suppose it does require a bit of uh, pivoting. Pivoting is something that I've done and learnt to do very well for the last 18 months. Okay, so Georgia, we have here, there's, there's actually eight, nine gins in the range. We're about to release our fusion gin uh, in the next couple of weeks, which is an Asian style um, influence. Beautiful, beautiful gin, um, which has lemongrass and galangal and kaffir lime and grapefruit and things in it. So that's beautiful, that's not here today. So we have uh, here at the moment five gins. We've decided are the, the ones we want to try today. So we have um, Finn's Navy Strength, have a chameleon gin, which is a colour changing gin. Oh, which, it changes colour. Yes, it does. It is exciting. an amazing colour. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Mm. Heathcote Shiraz gin, because I couldn't be a Heathcote gin and not have a Shiraz <laughs> gin. It is unbelievable. Chocolate gin, which also has a, an interesting story that relates to my children. And a smoked chilli gin, which you insisted we put on the, um, on the board. 
Cool, yeah, no, so Harry Finlayson was a local in Heathcote many, many, many years ago, uh, who was actually on the um, on a boat that actually went out to fight a war that um, allows us to be here doing what we do today. And the, the ship sunk in a, in a battle and everyone perished on the, on the boat. But they only found the shipwreck about only a few years ago. The story is incredible, and I will make sure I get that story to you properly so this because is it is. A so this is a tribute to Harry Finlayson. So now this is our Navy Strength Gin, and there's a few diff different sort of slight variations on the on the story. But um, gin was used as a form of currency. So in order to measure whether they were getting the right alcohol content, which was at 57%, um, that was considered to have a higher value than something of lesser, lesser you know, alcohol mm -hmm. volume. Um, you can light it at 57% with gunpowder. Uh -huh. And the whole thing behind gin and quinine, because quinine would, is, is a safeguard for malaria, which is why we drink gin and tonics all through summer, so you don't get bitten by the mozzies. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the story we use. Um, <laughs> and so, so that's how 57% um, uh, became a Navy strength measure. Because if it spills on the gunpowder, you can still light it. Correct. So they would every so often check it. If it wouldn't light, then they were getting ripped off. So it's a bit of a version of being underpaid, yeah. under award wage, well, so there you go. Get, get, let's get a pay rise. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So this has um, lemon myrtle, mm. uh, sweet orange in there. Obviously it's got the juniper, got coriander, angelica, oris and cassia bark. This is actually angelica. a... Angelica is, that. it's a very earthy, a um, bit of a spicy, earthy kind of botanical. Angelica and oris are commonly found in gins. Um, they really bring and hold and bind all the botanicals together. So they're very commonly used, as is coriander as well. So it's a very simple gin, but it really does seem to just work. Mm. So It smells quite complex, like it's yeah. that citrus Absolutely. Kind of. but, um, and this is really easy to drink on its own, believe it or not. A frail little thing like me can drink it on meat, so <laughs> I'm sure you can too. Kind of all right, isn't Yum. it? So if it doesn't make you go like that, that's a good outcome. Mm. Um, so of course, people are intimidated by the higher alcohol content. I think you've got to embrace it. For me, and, and at the cellar door, this is what we use for our gin and tonics. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really, really lovely gin. Mm, it's delicious. Stick around for more chats and more gins after the break. Whilst filming the Salador in Bendigo, our crew chose to stay at Byron's Vale Vineyard and Accommodation Bendigo. The heritage two-storey stone stables at Byron's Vale offer three superbly restored and renovated self-contained apartments designed to provide all the comforts expected in fine accommodation. The stables are surrounded by picturesque farmland overlooking Bendigo's oldest Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon vines. For inquiries to purchase wine or to book your stay at Byron's Vale, head to byronsvale.com.au. I'm in the heart of Heathcote and I've settled in for a chat with local gin icon Claire Voighton. Was gin something that had been sort of on your radar for a long time? Or? No, it really wasn't. I mean, I've always been the G&T girl hold the gin because gin, we were so limited with our choices. We really didn't have a, an Australian gin to sort of lean towards. But in the last, say, three or four years, and you know, Four Pillars have really pioneered that for Australian producers. Um, it's been... Uh, something that I've been a lot more fascinated with pretty much because of the botanicals yes. and what can go into the bottle. So I usually describe gin as having its own DNA mm -hmm. and that's kind of where I, I really lights me up and animates me and allows my creative juices to flow a little. And you're also quite passionate about the connection between where something comes from Absolutely, in terms of yeah. what you're consuming. Yeah. You were mentioning something about the botanicals being predominantly local. Yeah, so everything in Heathcote gin, in a Heathcote gin bottle is either sourced 
um, or reflect it reflects the region. So there's a few botanicals we don't grow here at the moment. Some we a lot, some we do source um, and grow. But the longer term plan um, is that we will have everything growing in in and around Heathcote on our own place. Actually, so that's that's sort of the longer term plan that I hope I can get across the line sooner than sooner than later. But again, <laughs> another business 2020, plan. Twenty twenty. It is. It's another business plan. <laughs> and really, what I want to do is to be able to have people come to a place on acreage uh, where they can actually experience and understand what goes behind a bottle of gin. So, you know, talking about the juniper and showing them the lemon myrtle and, you know, what's the difference between orange and sweet orange and dried orange and how that can impact on the flavour of a gin and um, coriander. I mean, people look at coriander and they stick it in their food, but it's one of the core botanicals in so many gins that we, we drink now. Mm -hmm. So, and the dynamics of those botanicals and how they behave with each other really change the impact of a gin as well. Talk me through your process of deciding what what infusions to put in your gins because you've got quite a quite an interesting mix of yeah. flavours of gin. I um I describe uh, the making of or coming up with an idea of gin or making gin like making a chocolate cake. So you can have twenty thousand different chocolate cake recipes and they all essentially make chocolate cake. But there's something ever so slightly different about each recipe that you'll you'll have, and the same can be said for gin. So it might be that the amount of juniper that you put in that this one gin, um, you don't need as much in another one. So the, the whole, it, it's really, I feel like I've fluked it a little bit. So I wanted chocolate gin, for example, and it was like, well, how do we get that? How do we make that happen? Because um, I figured that chocolate gin would be a really, really good idea, and it was. Yes, yeah. so did, you, did you nail it? Absolutely right. without it, of course, and you will find that out very soon. Yeah, I'm so, quite excited about that. Uh, so the, I guess the botanicals, there are certain botanicals that really should be in a gin. Some of the botanicals give you the, the earthy flavours that are very typical of a gin. Obviously you've got to have juniper. Um, if you don't have juniper, you can't call it gin. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it's the mix of how they behave with other things. So um, I've got a raspberry gin where we've used our base founders gin and added a few other botanicals and local Victorian raspberries to actually create this incredible gin. It just kind of worked. Mm. So I may not be the ideal case study for how you spend three or four years in producing the perfect concoction because we kind of nailed it very quickly. Well, you don't need to convince me. Another gin, please. So basically I'm a chocoholic mm -hmm. and I would hide my chocolate in every corner and crevice in the house. Because you have three Because I have three children, three <laughs> sons. And so they kept finding it. So I thought, buggy you lot, because they're all underage, I'm going to stick my chocolate in my gin and they can't touch it. And that is the true story. Um, but I always thought, what could, could, A, could it even be done? And what would be the outcome? And it is really chocolate in a bottle. So it's it's so good. So it is a sweeter gin. I love this um, over um, ice cream. Oh, yum. Yep, so it's like a bit like a frangelico affogato kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just drink it neat on its own. I don't even put ice in it, but when you do put ice in it, it creates a completely different experience mm -hmm. again. Um, and also as a gin and tonic, it's delicious. Blood orange, it's beautiful. Uh, oh yeah, the chocolate yeah. orange. Absolutely. And the citrus in the gin. And the citrus basically. in the gin, so it's really good. So there's hazelnut, you'll get the nutty tones of hazelnut and um, almond in there. So you- uh, Hazelnut and, sorry, hazelnut and, yeah, an almond. Mm. Yeah, it's cool. Mm. Yeah, you get that hazelnut straight away. An almond. Almost like a marzipan. Mm. Yes. Mm. And it kind of does this thing on the palate. It, it yes, it does things. <laughs> it changes. Mm. Yeah. That's delicious. It's all right, hey? Yeah. Mm. That's almost got a smoky, like, what is that? that There's actually a little bit of chilli in there as is well. Is that what it is? Yeah, so it's, it, gives it, it gives the warmth. Mm. Um, it was, we were tossing up to whether to um, make it a chopped chilli gin, but I thought, no, nah, let's just, just, just do chocolate. People are people aren't really sure what good. to do with this, and it's like just try just drink it. it guys. Just drink it. <laughs> don't don't sweat on it too much. Don't overthink it. Just enjoy it. Yeah, it's yum. so good. Speaking of very local produce, ah yes, the Heathcote Shiraz gin. This is amazing. So we actually use um, this started up um, at a within a conversation in a pub 
um, on the outskirts of Heathcote mm -hmm. uh, with another woman who's a wine producer by the name of Jess Dwyer who owns her own brand called Farmer and the Scientist. I tasted her Shiraz wine and it was mind blowing. And um, I dared to ask her, I said, what would you think if we tried your Shiraz with my gin? And we did it and it was like, wow. And I was pretty guarded about it because asking a wine producer to do that is a big deal in the first place. Um, but she actually loved it and I was so pleased. And we, honestly, we nailed it first time. So Excellent. where it's different to other Shiraz gins is we're actually using the Shiraz wine rather than just the yeah, grape so the juice. Yeah, so you don't use the grapes. You, yeah. So she will make the Shiraz? She, yeah, she produces the Shiraz. So we were going to run with her 2016 Shiraz uh, vintage and just before we went to go into production, she said, don't, you need to try my 2018, it's uh, even better. Mm -hmm. So we actually um, have used her 2018 Shiraz. Um, it's, it's beautiful and um, yeah, no, it's delicious. So hopefully you like it. I'm sure I will. Yeah. I always, um, with the Shiraz gin, I always say to people, open it, let it breathe for a little bit. Uh -huh. So I think gin actually gets better once it's opened, mm -hmm. um, but not dissimilar to a, shall give you this one? Oh, okay. Dissimilar to a uh, Shiraz wine or any wine, just let it breathe for a moment. Uh, but this is really spectacular. I just don't do anything other than just drink it oh, neat. Oh, wow. It's really lovely. So you'll have those citrus botanicals, the lemon myrtle will shine through, but the oh, Shiraz. Depth of yeah, Shiraz. Yeah, absolutely. Fruit. Mm. Oh my God, that smells amazing. How long do I have to let it breathe? For? You're done. Okay, You're ready right. to go. <laughs> Mm. Oh my God, that's delicious. It's not bad, is it? It's really good. Yeah. And the beauty of that is that every year it will change. Yeah. It's, it's almost got a sweet kind of... Yeah, there's a little sweet, yeah, mm. absolutely. I don't know how that happened, but it kind of worked. So, yeah, mm. it's great. Oh my God, that's so good. Mm. And try it, and it's also great as a G&T. Should we okay. yeah. I think you should. Again, not too much, just a little bit, just to let the botanicals open up. Mm -hmm. um, you'd kill that if you put too much tonic in there. Yeah, so. yeah. That's great, the, that, um, the sort of tart quinine balances yeah. out that yeah. sweetness. Oh my God, that is delicious. It's good, isn't it? Mm. As with every episode of The Cellar Door, it's about now the countdown to a post-tasting nap begins. Back at Heathcote Gin and I'm chatting to Claire Voiton, who is not only a very busy entrepreneur, she's also a published author with a growing list of titles under her belt. So I wrote a book a few years ago called, um, which was um, about paddock to plate, so it was about the farm and, and the food and the connection between the two. Uh, and that was a, that was, um, that actually that was an incredible experience. It was a really cathartic one because I absolutely love writing. And so I love telling a story through whatever it is that I do. So I've got another book coming out which is about gin. gin. Mm. Absolutely. So really what I see as my mission is to get people to look beyond the bottle of gin and think about what's in it and how it came to be. And when you think about all the distillers in the world, and as we know, gin's the fastest growing spirit in the world, and there are gins popping up every single week, but they are all so different and so unique. So they've all got their own DNA, their identity, they've got a beautiful story behind how they came to be. And it's always an incredible thing to hear people who have made their gin tell that story as to how it came to life. And some gins you won't like, a lot of them you'll love. If you're a gin lover, you'll love a lot of gins, but there are some that just won't suit you, but then that gin suits somebody else. Uh, so I think it's pretty incredible to be able to show that in a book. And it's really about entertaining but educating people on gin. You can find Claire's books through her online store. Thank you so much for sharing these it's with me. It's my absolute pleasure. It was, it was awesome to have you here, and I'm glad you've um, tried a few of the gins. Did you have a favourite? Um, do you know what? I think like you, the Shiraz and the chocolate, mm -hmm. both complimentary and delicious. Yep. But I mean, God, they were all amazing. They all have a different role to play. Mm. And that's the thing, there's no sort of one gin that just fits one's 
occasion perfectly and mm. and again beauty is in the eye of the beholder or the bedrinker. Well, I think all um, of your brides are gorgeous. Oh thank you very much. <laughs> thank you Claire. <laughs> Next time you're in this neck of the woods do yourself a favour and pop into Heathcote Gin. I know I will be. Well I've already had another fantastic day here in Heathcote but there's still time for one last adventure so I thought I'd pack up our crew and head to Palling Brothers Brewery just down the road for a cold bevy and a bite to eat. Hello, Peter. George, welcome. Thank you. Welcome so to Palling Brothers Brewery. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Come on down. Great. Right. Well, I'm Peter. I'm the owner of the brewery. Palling Brothers is an independent craft beer brewery that doubles as a function venue. And it's a pretty top place to spend the golden hours of a lazy afternoon. Heat's about to give me the run of the place. I can feel it. Their core range includes your regular hoppy heroes, everything from your pale ale, IPA, traditional lager, and there are always a few seasonal specials on the go. Don't mind if I do, Peter. Looking for some food? You've come to the right place. Although I'm a little worried I may be about to disappoint Peter. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever had dad before? Um, I have, but I have a devastating admission. Tell me. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> You've got no idea. I'm so sorry. No, that's but funny. it smells it's amazing. It's funny you say that it because does actually I didn't make good. enough for you. I've just made it for these two. Just you 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 At least he's a good sport and my crew are very happy. Well, that's it for another episode of The Cellador Australia. Remember to catch up on old episodes online and we'll see you next time. <laughs>